Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the College of Forest Resources. I wish to welcome all of you to the 11th Denman Forest Reissue Series entitled The Changing Northwest World, Keeping It Green. We look forward to an exciting and informative program today, and we are especially pleased that Mr. Dick Denman, who along with his wife, Mary Ellen, provide the support for this series is with us this afternoon. The purpose of the Denman Forest Reissue Series is to provide information and discussion on timely forestry and natural resource issues. Our ultimate goal is to inform and educate our students, faculty, staff, as well as resource professionals, landowners, and the general public. These programs are made possible through the generous support provided by the Denman Endowment for Student Excellence in Forest Resources, and they support the college's vision of being a world-class and internationally recognized source of knowledge for environmental and natural resource issues. The mission of the College of Forest Resources is to study and investigate the sustainability and functionality of complex natural resource and environmental systems in both natural and managed environments using an interdisciplinary approach across multiple spatial and temporal scales of urban, suburban, and wildland landscapes. Our programs focus on sustainable forestry, sustainable urban ecosystems, and sustainable forest enterprises. Sustainability serves as the goal and focal point for our programs and includes all resources such as timber, plants, water, wildlife, or insects, for example, considers the needs of future generations as well as those of the present, and strives for a, a dynamic equilibrium that balances ecological functions and conditions along with social and economic factors. Today, our topic concerns the changing Northwest world, keeping it green. Basically, we're talking about maintaining working forest across the landscape. So I first want to spend a few moments defining what we mean by the term working forest. First, a characteristic of a working forest is a well-managed, sustainable forest as measured in terms of ecological, economic, and social metrics. Second, a working forest preserves a non-fragmented or permanent land base where both commodity and environmental services can flow over the long term. Third, a working forest is viewed as an actively managed property for the production of commodity goods, environmental services, and social values sought by landowners and society and not set aside in an unmanaged state. And fourth and last, a working forest must conserve, conserve and enhance soil productivity and conservation values so that future benefits flow over the long term. Why is it important to maintain working forest across the landscape? Well, first, these forests provide commodities valued by society. Second, they produce a large array of environmental services of value to society. And third, society associates a healthy and a high quality, quality of life with the maintenance of working forests across the landscape. Today, our speakers will address some new ways to protect our region's working forest using a variety of policy instruments. We must recognize First, that governmental regulations put in place to protect public natural resource values may simultaneously and perhaps inadvertently diminish private property rights to the point where landowners initiate forest conversion to other less environmentally friendly uses, certainly an unintended consequence of the regulations. It is time to re-examine some of these regulations to ensure that the benefits they promise exceed the costs they impose. Second, 
we must seek to broaden the portfolio of possible revenue sources available to landowners so they receive compensation for the array of environmental services and new products they produce. And last, we must evaluate a wide, wide range of methods that are, are available for monetizing these benefits to encourage landowners to produce them for future generations. These and other topics are the subject of our presentation this afternoon. With us today are speakers from a conservation group and the UW College of Forest Resources. Our topic is the changing Northwest forest landscape, keeping it green. And to lead us through this program, we're pleased to have as our moderator, Mr. Brian Boyle from the College of Forest Resources. My role here basically is to introduce the speakers. I'd like to introduce Jean Duvernoy. Jean is the president of the Cascade Land Conservancy in Seattle. Jean has been a leader in resource and land conservation for many years in government, in research institutions, in law firms, in the private sector. And over the last decade, he has led the Cascade Land Conservancy and the Conservancy has achieved some real national prominence with development of broad, innovative, and successful conservation strategies. And, and the Conservancy, and particularly Gene, have been instrumental in the conservation and stewardship of tens of thousands of acres of critical resource lands and landscapes in Washington State. In 2004, the Municipal League of King County awarded Gene the Jim, the Jim Ellis Leadership Award recognizing his, his go, uh, work and his goals. Gene is going to talk about the Cascade Agenda 100 years forward, connecting our economy, environment, and communities. Gene? Good afternoon. Thank you, Bruce. Okay. Um, we, we are going to talk about the Cascade Agenda. And the Cascade Agenda is a 40,000-word document. If you want to learn more about what I'm talking about, you see the advertisement up there, look at CascadeAgenda.com. That has the full report and all the strategies in 40,000 word detail. Now what the Cascade Agenda was about was a recognition in a four county area that, that things were changing quite rapidly and dramatically. And that if we are really going to look at this region and have some hope of maintaining our quality of life, our working landscapes, um, our other values that we hold so dear in this region, we have to do two things, three things. First, we have to look very long. We have to look out 100 years and try to get a sense of what's happening to this region. And when we talk about landscape and conserving the lands that we need to conserve in this region to really handle the trends and issues over the next 100 years, it's not just a matter of environment. Obviously, the environmental issues ring first and foremost, but we also have to think about our regional economy. What lands are critical for our regional economy? It does our region little good if we can preserve our environment, but nobody has a job. We also have to look at if, how we continue to provide good communities, good housing choices. Same reasoning. Does this region little good if we have a great environment, but no homes or un, 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 uh, unaffordable homes and no jobs? So we have looked at this landscape very broadly thinking about those three issues. So um, real quickly, we have talked, as we put together what you will see in a minute, is a very ambitious conservation plan. We have talked to literally 4,000 people across this region, including a number of experts, uh, uh, folks here, uh, timber economists, t uh, uh, professors in the forestry school. We've talked to practitioners in the field at Weyerhaeuser at Plum Creek. We've talked to conservationists, other scientists, to really put together two things. First, a very ambitious view of what, we, what landscapes we need to conserve over the long term, much of it being working forest. And secondly, what are the market-based approaches that we can use to really secure that conservation over the long term? So again, I won't be talking about regulation. I'm going to be looking at market-based approaches. I'm assuming that regulation is out there. Not surprisingly, the overarching issue over the next 100 years is population growth. 
If you look out over 100 years, and this is very interesting, most, most of us in most of our governmental work or in our other planning work only look 20 or 30 or 40 years out. And you don't look, the envelope doesn't look too bad. But if you look out 100 years, all of a sudden you recognize, and you can see it on this chart, uh, we could be a region, this four county area, could be a region of over 7 million people. Now, many demographers tell me we are too conservative here. But basically, we could double our population in 100 years. Well, if that's what we can anticipate, what kind of conservation of working forests and other lands do we need to undertake now so that as we accept that future population, we can maintain our environment, our economy, and housing choices? So look at this. This is, I think these pictures are very dramatic. You're flying over Snohomish, looking over to King Pierce, and then over to Kittitas. This is how we look today. The red squiggles, they're the urban growth boundaries and the Growth Management Act. And as you can see, as we grow, we're staying within that, that area. We're not doing so bad. The, the foothills are still forested. Our agricultural valleys are still in agriculture. Now, as you look out just 20 years, it, it looks OK. We, we continue to look like we're staying within the boundaries. That's where most of our planning effort, what we call long term, ends 20, 30 years out. So we're not planning much beyond that. But if you look out much beyond that, if you look out actually 100 years, taking those kind of population figures and assuming we don't quite grow up as much as we grow out, it's a dramatically different landscape. It is radically different. We are starting to really go into those very landscapes that we're all talking about today, our working forests and other landscapes. We will force society to invade those landscapes. We have done an extensive analysis of the various landscapes in this four county region. And to really say, in the face of a growing uh, population, a doubling population, that we can maintain our working forests, a good farm base, um, our ecosystems, and a, a chance for a good, strong economy, we need to conserve 1.265 million acres, a whopping number of acres. Now, of that 1.265, fortunately, most is working. Most of it is farm and forest land. A million acres is farm and forest land. And we'll talk about how we can conserve those lands shortly. The other 265,000 acres have to be preserved outright, natural areas, shorelines, parks, and other issues. So we know how to do this. And you heard a lot of the, the talk early today and how we can do this by creating new markets, by finding new ways to finance conservation, and some other mechanisms. But we can only do this, we can only reach this level of conservation if we reduce the pressure on that area, the population pressure on those conserved landscapes. So there's two two ends to this strategy. First, actively go out and conserve those landscapes, and we'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. Secondly, um, we need to talk about how we make our cities attractive to population. If we really want to conserve, conserve the working forests, and we've all heard this, it's all about real estate value, it's all about population pressure. If we really want to conserve those working forests, we truly have to commit ourselves to making our urban neighborhoods, urban cities, our cities very attractive to families. Not just folks without income, but families and the entire population. With, with solid jobs, good schools, heavy infrastructure. So let's talk a little bit about our working forests. In this four county area, um, what you see on the screen right now, particularly the, the um, colorful map with the, with the um, orange to, to deep red landscape there, those are the private working forest lands. And what you see there is, a, is a, in essence, a rough priority of, of what lands we need to conserve first, from um, hot red to, to lesser orange. If we move ahead with the conservation of what the next screen will show you is about 780,000 acres of forest land. After doing a substantial amount of economic analysis in this four county region, it is our estimate that to have a market, a working forest that can be supported over the long term, we need to conserve about 93% of the current working forest today, a substantial amount of forest land. So that land needs to be is conserved. If we can conserve that level of forest land in our four county region, we can support the level of infrastructure that lets it survive. So that 780 acres, 780,000 acres, is identified in various intensities of color in that map to the right. So we have some sense of how we have to proceed with this conservation. Now, when I say conservation of this working forest land, basically what I'm talking about is how do you remove the real estate value off that land? So we have 780,000 acres that we have to remove the real estate value from. 
in order to keep it conserved and available for working forests. Then after that, we need to secure the timber, econ the economic timber stream over the long term, so that in fact folks are willing to, to remove their development value. And we have to explore those other um, ecosystem service um, uh, revenue sources to really help this, this, this whole transaction work. So um, just to provide us perspective, just look at the Carbon River here. This is what it looked like pre-European settlement. And then um, in 1910, really cut significantly. And look at the size of those cuts. Really dramatic. By 1930, 1950, rather, you're starting to see some recovery. Uh, today, it's a very different forest than it was 80, 90 years ago. So again, as part of the conservation community, I understand and recognize we cannot preserve these lands. We, we would never have enough money. We have to find a way to economically support this sus the, uh, these lands being sustained in, con in working forests. And you start to see a very complex matrix over time that provides a host of ecosystem services. These are very valuable lands to society as working timber, not just for its, its economic value, but for its ecosystem value. So how do we reach this goal? I said there is a million acres of conservation land, um, working landscapes, 780,000 of that million is working forest. Then there's another 265,000 acres of land we need to preserve outright in this four county region. It, 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 we bifurcate our strategies. In the near term, it's all about how we acquire the necessary conservation interests, necessary property rights to these lands so they continue to be open and available. Over the midterm, we need to look at how we really need to, to, to support and enhance their connectivity. And then over the long term, how do, how do we provide the economic, um, uh, sustained economic cash flow so they continue to operate over the long term? There's 5.3 million acres in this region, uh, um, and we're looking at adding to the current open landscape of 2.8 million acres um, an additional 1.265 million acres. It's a $7 billion problem. We have a $7 billion problem to conserve 1.265 million acres. Let's break that $7 billion down. How do we reach $7 billion to conserve this landscape in this region? Basically, a lot of it is from financing. We have new ways to access patient capital, new ways to levy bonds, and other ways to access cheap and patient capital to raise, I'm talking about the middle point, one to three billion dollars of, of money that then we can use to buy working forest landscape and have the revenue from that working forest pay off the, um, the, the initial cost of that property. There's another $2 billion we can acquire from current government programs over the next 30 years. We spend between uh, 60 to $80 million a year for conservation in this region. If we focus it on these lands, that's a $2 billion number over the next 20 to 30 years. So I can get us, we can get you, to between three and four billion dollars of value to cover that seven billion dollars. The last amount, that last three to four billion dollars, has to come from new markets, whether it's carbon sequestration or development right markets or those other markets. There is a sufficient capacity in some initial analysis, there's sufficient capacity in those new markets to cover the rest of that cost. On financing working landscape, between one and one billion and two billion dollars of financing is readily available in the capital marketplace. Now the capital marketplace, bonds and, and, and other mechanisms like that, are, are a trillion dollar marketplace. So when I say one to two billion dollars, it sounds a lot to me and maybe to you all too, but in that marketplace where you can get that financing, it is tiny. What we need here are the, um, are the vehicles approved by government, whether it, it's tax exempt financing to purchase forest land like this, or whether it's, it's a mechanism that the land conservancy is experimenting with, a way to get equity directly called privately placed securities. We need new financing tools that are patient enough, long term enough to allow us to operate a decent harvest and are at low enough cost of money, three, four percent, so we can afford to hold this land and extinguish the development rights or trade them so that we can get in there and play at a very significant level. The big question are those new markets that, that we're experimenting with, where you're bringing governments in, and we're really trying to exploit uh, carbon sequestration, uh, uh, water quality, and most importantly, moving development rights around. Let me touch base on that one, because that is probably the most immediate market we can explore. To move the, the, the big issue, particularly in our working landscapes, our forest, as a number of the other speakers said, 
is taking that residential value and, and, and capturing it and moving it, compensating the landowners so they don't have to sell the land to realize that value. The one way we can do that, and we've experimented in this region in a small way here already, one way we can do that is to allow a marketplace to develop so that in some areas where you want to develop more intensely, you don't allow that intense development to occur unless they buy the development value off of some lands elsewhere. So we all share in the, in the growth and the, and the wealth that's generated in that development. Why I think we can do this here is twofold. One, we got the talent in this region, incredibly talented re region. Two is when you look at the population growth, if three and a half pe billion people are really coming here, that basically, um, of that three and a half billion people, if we housed 20% of that new population in homes that were authorized through such a market, we would capture $4 billion of value. Now, just to show you that we can do this, this is what the Snoqualmie Valley, Snoqualmie Forest looks like today and will look like forever, where you see a working landscape up there, where there's good, uh, a good timber uh, uh, product flow, where there is all those ecosystem services. 90,000 acres within the Snoqualmie Forest was owned by Weyerhaeuser, now owned by Hancock. It'll look like this forever because King County purchased the development rights from that site, 90,000 acres, $22 million last year. Now that was a purchase of those development rights, but that's the challenge for us. We need to work a marketplace so that gets transferred so it's not public money, but it's private to private so we can do this not just on 90,000 acres, but on another 780,000 acres. The alternative would have been a series of, of, of uh, developments and we would have lost all the ecosystem services to that site we would have lost all the timber economy and timber jobs from that site. So the risk is real, but we know how to conserve this land. If you want to hear more about the Cascade Agenda, I welcome you to go to CascadeAgenda.com. Thank you very much. Um, the next speaker is Gordon Bradley. Gordon is Professor of Forest Land Use Planning in the College of Forest Resources here at the university. The focus of his research has been on, and still is, on human response to land use changes along this urban to wildland gradient that we're talking about, the relationship between forest lands and the built environment, and urban ecology. Um, Gordon has worked extensively with public agencies at all levels and with numerous private natural resource management companies on their policies, has edited, edited a couple of books about the issue of the urban forest interface and is going to talk about a specific case study, the Tiger Mountain um, State Forest. Gordon? Hey, thank you very much, Brian. I think from all of the comments that we've heard so far, there's clearly a challenge today to maintain forest cover in our northwest forest landscapes. And uh, what I'd like to talk about is um, Tiger Mountain, which I think represents a case uh, that illustrates how we can maintain forest cover in rapidly urbanizing environments. And uh, in this case, uh, we've talked a little bit about you know large, uh, large industrial landscapes, small private non-industrial forest landscapes. <clears throat> to be clear here that in the case of uh, Tiger Mountain, what we're going to be talking about is a 13,000 acre state forest. Okay, so this is an area that's managed by the Washington State Department of Natural Resources. It's located about 15 miles to the uh, east of Seattle and provides the visual backdrop for the cities of, uh, the fast-growing cities of Issaquah and Sam uh, Sammamish. Now, to frame my uh, comments today and suggest why I think Tiger Mountain can be held up as a success, I'd like to draw on the work of the late uh, Marion Clausen. <clears throat> Dr. Clausen was an economist with the uh, Resources for the Future, and for a period of time he was also uh, the director of the uh, Federal Bureau of Land Management. And uh, I have used uh, Dr. Clausen's work on a number of occasions. Brian mentioned uh, a, a book that we did actually a number of years ago. It was the proceedings of a symposium that was looking at questions of forest land conversion and some of the problems of managing forest lands in these changing land use environments. Certainly many of the problems and issues that we had looked at 25 years ago are every bit as relevant today 
But as some of the speakers have talked about today too, there's hope because there have been many innovative kinds of institutions and solutions that have come about that I think have advanced uh, where we were uh, uh, 25 years ago. In addition to the uh, framework uh, that uh, Dr. Claussen offered, he also had an idea that if we were to solve contemporary forest problems, we may need to seek what he called uh, social inventions. And <clears throat> social inventions seek to develop wholly new ideas, often by substantial rearrangement of old ideas into new forms, and to provide a mechanism whereby new and different actions may be taken. Dr. Klassen provided a few examples of the kinds of things that uh, he was thinking about when we talked about social inventions. The concept of land use zoning, whereby certain uses are permitted in some areas and not in others. Uh, this was a case of, uh, certainly sometimes today when we think about zoning, and again referenced in, in other uh, presentations, as, as sort of a negative thing, but the fact of the matter was the case existed where you had a couple of different land uses that were incompatible that were driving down the prices of other landowners' property. And the way to do, to address that question was to separate those uses. Thus came about the idea of zoning to maintain those property values. The idea of long-term regulatory amortized mortgages with fixed interest rates on residential property, something that allows you and I to get into our homes today, something that didn't exist. It hasn't always been there. And finally, the idea of professionals or the profession of private uh, consulting foresters whose services are available for a fee to any interested forest landowner. <laughs> well, what I would like to do then is to uh, comment on the rest of Dr. Claussen's framework here. When he was suggesting that when you're evaluating the potential success of an invention, in particular a social invention pertaining to the management of forest resources, he was suggesting that there is a framework that we should look at and uh, indicate that if these are going to be successful, what is it that we should consider? Now, we can apply this to Tiger Mountain. I think it can be equally applied to any other kind of a situation. And he was suggesting that we should look at the physical and biological feasibility, the economic efficiency, the economic equity, the cultural acceptability, and operational practicality. And so what we want to do today is to see how those factors relate to the success of uh, Tiger Mountain State Forest as a contemporary social invention. This is the image of the Puget Sound region where we can see those areas that have been heavily developed and we travel out uh, the I-90 corridor and we find ourselves here which is the 13,000 acres of the Tiger Mountain State Forest. Clearly an area <clears throat> that is uh, close to uh, urbanizing landscapes under pressure of, uh, uh, of development as we can see in those um, surrounding areas. The Tiger Mountain State Forest is also one of the westernmost parcels in the other, I guess I would call social invention, the Mountains to Sound Greenway, a very successful effort that only came about about 15 years ago, but has already addressed the needs of over 100,000 acres of forest and farmlands to m maintain those as uh, working uh, forest uh, landscapes. To look a little bit more closely at Tiger Mountain itself, to get an appreciation for what those 13,000 acres looked like and its proximity to development, is that we have Issaquah right over uh, to the uh, west of the property. We have um, Interstate 90 running across the northern part of the property. But this northern uh, portion of the uh, uh, forest, about 4,000 acres, is a lighter green. And that's actually designated the West Tiger Mountain Natural Resource Conservation Area. And we'll talk about why it has that designation and what that means to keeping the forest green. The rest of the forest, about 9,000 acres, is the Tiger Mountain State Forest, where it has the uh, trust obligation, in other words, it has to be managed for revenues, to be turned to, returned to actually the six trusts that are served uh, on uh, Tiger Mountain. So, Let's see how Tiger Mountain measures up on Claussen's five criteria. Well, if we think about the physical biological feasibility, in any particular natural resource management situation, one needs to ask the question, what can be done with the resource? In other words, what is, it, uh, uh, that, uh, what is the physical and biological feasibility for managing that landscape, and what are the consequences of allocating land for various uses? Initially, as indicated, there were 13,000 acres that were forested land, 
that were managed for the trust. But it became apparent uh, when uh, they began to look very critically at those landscapes that there were problems with portion of it in terms of being able to manage it intensively for timber. There were problems, uh, concerns for views, topography, steep slopes, some very old timber stands, city inholdings, some water bodies, a variety of features like that. And so what came about was to create a portion of that landscape, which was that portion, 4,000 acres approximately, that were in that lighter green color that became the West Tiger Mountain Natural Resource Conservation Area. Land partly owned uh, by and managed by the Department of Natural Resources and a portion of that by the uh, city of Issaquah. So when we look at these landscapes, large or small, public or private, the first thing is to try and sort out what it is that we have, what are the constraints, how are we going to make those allocations, what are the physical and biological constraints in operating for different kinds of purposes. The DNR did that in this particular case. After determining the physical possibilities of the land, what are the costs and benefits in monetary terms? Are we going to manage these forests in a way that are truly working? In other words, the revenues from the management are going to exceed the costs. In this case, there's an active timber management program on Tiger Mountain. There's uh, an annual uh, flow of wood that comes off of the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the forest. Approximately 2.9 million board feet, over a million dollars a year, are returned to, again, the six trusts that are served by the forest. 78% of that money goes to the trust themselves, 22% uh, to the management fund, which is is uh, typical for uh, Department of Natural Resource lands. The other positive aspect that exists on Tiger Mountain is its uh, topography, obviously a uh, fairly prominent feature, which you can actually see from the University of Washington campus on a clear day, an ideal site for a variety of TV, radio, and cell towers, which all of a sudden have become very uh, popular for leases, returning about $425,000 per year to uh, the uh, Department of Natural Resources just for the lease of those uh, sites. The whole question of economic equity uh, concerns the distribution of benefits that flow from the forest. And this is clearly important for serving a broad range of, of interest groups. We've talked about the fact that there is a, a flow of timber that comes off of the forest. And so those interests are served very well by the, uh, uh, the activities of uh, the Department of Natural Resources. The foresters, the processors, the loggers, all of those that benefit from that particular activity. But there are other activities that take place there, other benefits that are distributed to a wide range of groups. There's a lot of trail activities, whether it's hiking, uh, whether it's uh, mountain biking, equestrian activities. In fact, it's one of the premier launch sites for hang gliders and parasailers in the uh, whole uh, part of western Washington. And, of course, there are other features that make it very attractive and serve other interests as well, fish and wildlife, and as well as the uh, amenity features that exist there, serving uh, probably in excess of about 175,000 recreation visitors each year. And so here we have the distribution of these economic or these, uh, these benefits that actually cut across kind of economic, ecological, and social uh, uh, factors, which uh, gets at sort of this idea of sustainability, which I think is also key to the long-term success of these parcels and keeping them green. The idea of cultural acceptability is one that uh, for some people, kind of economic and ecological considerations may not be relevant to their particular calculations, like that or not. And there are some uses that may create problems for continuing management. And of course, timber harvesting is certainly one of those uses that can be controversial, especially if done very intensively in full view of the public. And I think this is an interesting case here on Tiger Mountain. Uh, this is a uh, image represents Tiger Summit. Several thousand people a day pass right by here, and this view of Tiger Mountain is what it is that they see. So the choice of the managers was to figure out how it is that they were going to manage this particular uh, landscape, knowing full well that revenues were going to flow, but how was it that they were going to harvest this area? They developed a harvest scheme, <laughs> leaving about 12 to 15 acres, and then also realized that uh, accessing this by road was going to be problematic if a road ran through the middle of this slope, and so it was helicopter logged. 
Now, I want to uh, emphasize the fact that um, it doesn't mean here that the managers of Tiger Mountain shy away from intensive forest management practices. Indeed, throughout the forest, uh, very intensive practices exist. And this is a case in point of one where they purposefully put the harvest right next to a hiking trail so as to take advantage of the opportunity to educate uh, the visitors to the forest. So the trail went right through this harvest. They put up educational signs saying, this 27 acres was harvested for these purposes. So many dollars went to these different kinds of trusts, creating this opportunity for understanding and acceptability among those people that use the forest. Also, they spend many hours in educational efforts with uh, elementary school, high school, and college students each year on just general educational programs. Uh, where the uh, mountain actually has lots of interesting features relevant to the curriculum of those kinds of institutions. The last point that we want to talk about is operational practicality. I mean, the whole question is, can you do what it is that you set out to do? And this is an interesting question here with, uh, with the uh, Tiger Mountain State Forest. It was not always 13,000 contiguous acres of forest land. In fact, Initially, the state forest was about 7,000 acres of Department of Natural Resources land intermingled with about another 7,000 acres of warehouser and other ownerships. And so if you're going to try and manage effectively, what you're going to have to do is to block that up. And the Department of Natural Resources went through an exercise of what they call block planning to create these kinds of management efficiencies. And so now Tiger Mountain, for the most part, is 13,000 contiguous acres of forest land that can be managed very effectively and efficiently. I think it's important to mention, too, some of the extra steps that the department has gone to to reach out to its constituency to make sure that, in fact, those things that they decide to do are things that they can do when it comes time to do them, whether it's laying out a trail, developing a program, or laying out a harvest and having that sold. In this particular case, the, uh, there was an advisory committee that was established initially to set up the Tiger Mountain land use plan. They also are not at all reluctant to bring in visiting expertise of a variety of kinds. And of course, uh, with limited staff nowadays, um, the use of volunteers is, is extremely important to the successful implementation of most of their programs. And they have uh, become masters of this in their educational programs, in the development of new facilities, in the maintenance of existing facilities. And I think uh, the volunteers that come there take pride and have some ownership in that landscape now, uh, constituents that are going to be in support of the Department of Natural Resources for a long time, whether this is from the Issaquah Alps Trails Club, surrounding communities, or the Mountains to Sound Greenway, all active participants in maintaining kind of the integrity of that forest. So this attractive, distinctive landscape along I-90 remains green and working. This isn't by chance, but it's by diligent management uh, that addresses the primary considerations for ensuring successful social inventions as suggested by Dr. Clausen. So in keeping our Northwest forest green, we need to remember that we need to allocate wisely, allocate wisely among potential uses commodity, amenity, reserves, and recreation. We need to pay attention to the bottom line, seeking any number of innovative ways to generate revenues. On Tiger Mountain, they've been very successful in their timber program, and more recently, these tower leases. But there's also opportunities for fee access and other environmental service credits, as has been spoken to in greater depth by others uh, this afternoon. We need to ensure a broad range of meaningful benefits. We need to deliver to many groups to sustain interest and support for these kinds of landscapes so that they feel ownership and some responsibility for the stewardship of these special places. It's important that we know the inclinations of our constituents. I've heard it many, many times, and I think it's uh, uh, Tiger Mountain illustrates this very well. Public acceptance is our license to practice forestry, and they go to, I think, uh, the extremes to do that. And of course, we need to be able to do what it is that we want to do. You only have to fail to deliver once to put your forest landscape at risk of not being productive and green in the future. Thank you.
Michael Andro is the last of our formal speakers. Michael has extensive experience in managing forest timberlands in the eastern, southeastern United States before he came to this university. And along with his PhD studies, he is also the coordinator for forest systems and the bioenergy program here at the college. And so the title of his discussion is going to be Biomass to Bioenergy, an Emerging Solution for the State of Washington. Michael? Thank you, Brian. So good day, everyone. Uh, I'm here to discuss uh, with you an emerging opportunity um, for Washington's forested landscapes. Um, and I'm going to talk about an idea that's emerging that's going to help keep uh, Washington's forests green. And when I talk about green, I mean green in, in several senses. First of all, I mean uh, green in the sense of keeping our forests healthy and growing uh, and providing some of those ecosystem services that were alluded to earlier. I talk about green in the second sense uh, of keeping our forested, green, forested and not converted to some other land use. Um, and finally, I talk about keeping forested green in terms of adding some economic value to the landowner. So at the, at the root of the issue, we have a forest health problem. What you're seeing here is a map of the region, uh, the Pacific Northwest region. Those areas in red are some of the 21 million acres in, Western, in the Western U.S. that are at high risk of bark beetle outbreaks. Why are these stands or why are these forests in high risk? Well, high risk forests tend to be forests that are, have an overabundance of trees competing for limited water and nutrient resources. And this problem is really compounded in times of drought, such as the year we're having this, this year, and mild winters, such as what we're having. And these conditions like this, in combination with these overly stocked stands, can lead to large uh, outbreaks killing millions of trees. If you want to get a sense of how big of a scale this can be, just look across our northern border in Canada and see some of the large devastating outbreaks that have occurred there. These dead trees then literally add fuel to another ecological problem, wildfire. On this map here you can see uh, of the region um, areas designated into four colors, green, yellow, red, and gray. Those areas in gray are, are areas of not, not of importance. They're of very, very low risk of fire. The areas in green are considered low priority areas for risk of fire. But those areas in yellow and red, those are the areas I want you to concentrate on because those are the areas, according to this study, that have been considered to be at high risk of losing some ecological value due to the fire regime being um, altered and out of, out of uh, normal um, condition. And, there, and if we do get some fires in there, they are at high risk of, of having a major loss of some ecological value. Now, I want to make some points here. If you just look at the state of Washington alone, there's about 12.4 million acres of treatable timberland in, in the state of Washington. Of that, 8.5 million acres are considered to be overly dense. Those are those areas on the map in the Washington that are in red and yellow. Now, if we were to treat those stands, in most of those areas, the, this, the way to get reduce that risk is to do some kind of treatment, we could remove about 242 million bone dry tons of biomass. Of that, 28% of it is two to eight inch material. Now we're talking about thinning here, we're not talking about clear cutting. And, uh, and of that, that two to eight inch material, that's the material that is problematic to utilize because today it is considered a uh, material that has little to no value. So how do we deal with these? What's the solution? Well, the solution that's been proposed to deal with these ecological problems is to thin. Thinning will decrease those fuel loads, eliminate those ladder fuels, those small trees that allow fires to get up into the crown that increase the cost of, fire, of fighting fires. And thinning will increase the available resources and reduce the stress for the remaining trees. It's going to uh, reduce the number of trees out there. Therefore, your residual trees can grow vigorously and healthy. But the question is, if we thin, can we use this biomass? And are these treatments affordable if this wood biomass can't be used? 
Well, what you're seeing here is a map that shows where mills have closed between the years of 1989 and 2003. Those dots in blue are where mills were closed. Those are saw mills and paper mills. Those dots in yellow indicate mills that have laid off individuals. From 1988 to 2000, the number of operating mills in the Columbia Basin were dropped by 50%. From 89 to 2001, the number of pulp mills in Pacific Northwest dropped by 35%. Now, those pulp mills, those are the ones that would have utilized and bid the greatest sink for utilizing that 2 to 8 inch material that I discussed earlier, or told you about earlier. But they're not there now. We have lost them. In addition, we've lost nearly 8,000 jobs, or over 8,000 jobs, uh, in the last decade. What this all means is that we're losing our infrastructure, both in terms of our mills, but also in terms of the people. These jobs are disappearing, and these, the, the, the workforce, the trained workforce that knows how to utilize and uh, work in the forest are disappearing too. And thus, we're losing our ability to address forest health problems. So this map here shows that there, where the residual pulp mills are, where our remaining infrastructure is. And while at first glance it might appear, hey, we've got a healthy uh, amount of mills left, it's really interesting to see that most of those pulp mills and paper mills are concentrated west of the Cascades. Yet if you remember the maps I showed you earlier, most of those insect uh, risk lands and the fire risk lands were east of the Cascades. And what you can see clearly is that east of the Cascades is not well serviced by this infrastructure. So a lot of people suggest that we should rebuild this infrastructure. We need to build more mills, add to this uh, infrastructure so that we can utilize this small diameter wood that's out there. And that's a good suggestion. Indeed, that is appropriate in some areas. But there's a lot of cost associated with building these large centralized systems in that they cost millions and millions and millions of dollars to build. They're very expensive. And so this infrastructure as, as such is almost cost prohibitive to, to bring back. And so we're not seeing those investments made in rebuilding that infrastructure. So what can we do? I've laid out a pretty grim, grim picture here. Well, I'm, I'm, I, the work I've been working on with the group of others is, is, is in developing a solution that I feel is very, very useful and would be very useful to provide uh, helping landowners. And that is taking and utilizing this small biomass and converting it to a liquid fuel. We have all this waste wood out there, and the way we do that is we use gasification technology. Now, what is gasifying? Gasifying is basically taking and uh, taking wood bio, woody biomass and driving off the gases and creating what's called a crude syngas. Now, the byproduct of that process is ash. It's the same content that you would have following a fire. From there, you take that crude syngas and run it through a gas cleaning process and create clean syngas. And that is primarily composed of CO2, carbon monoxide, CO, and hydrogen. That's all the components you need, then, to uh, have a very usable product. And clean syngas is something that you could utilize in that form. But the problem is, it's in a gaseous state. And when things are in a gaseous state, they're very difficult to transport and, and uh, store. And so if you want to create a more usable product, the best way would be to run it through a methanol reactor and create biomethanol. Biomethanol, or methanol, is CH3OH. So you can see from clean syngas, you have all the ingredients you need to create biomethanol. And from one bone dry ton of wood, you can convert uh, to 186 gallons of methanol. And that's based on one of our, a research study from one of our research partners, uh, NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab. So we have biomethanol, and that's also known as wood alcohol. There's a lot of times when I talk about methanol production, people assume I'm talking about ethanol. And ethanol is something as an alternative fuel we hear a lot of discussion about. But we're, what I'm talking about is methanol. And methanol is really the easiest alternative fuel to make from wood. So why am I talking about gasification? Because gasification is old technology. Back in World War II in Sweden and Germany, other parts of Europe, they were using gasification of woody biomass to create gas, syngas, 
to run their vehicles. And, and that was because they didn't have access to oil. Well, what's, what's going on differently? Why, why, why are we looking at it again today? And it's not just because oil prices are high, although that certainly is one driver. But we also have new technological breakthroughs. We have increased efficiencies in the conversion processes that now are making gasification a more realistic option, a more feasible option. In addition, there's been some developments in the hydrogen fuel cell uh, market that we uh, previously didn't have, and that's providing a new market for methanol, or in this case, biomethanol. Why am I talking about hydrogen fuel cells here when we're talking about wood? Well, we hear a great deal of talk about hydrogen fuel cells, and it's going to be the new economy, the new energy economy of the, of the future. But what has been the biggest barrier to hydrogen fuel cells being adopted? Hydrogen. Where do you get it? Well, why has it been such a problem? Because hydrogen's in a gas form. It's difficult to store. It's difficult to transport. It's difficult to uh, um, utilize. And so what would make it easier? Hydrogen in the form of uh, in a liquid carrier such as methanol. And now we have technology, hydrogen fuel cells, that can now utilize methanol as uh, the basis for providing the, the hydrogen. In this chart here, or in this picture here, you'll see several examples of some of the emerging technology that can utilize meth hydrogen fuel cells that utilize methanol to drive them. On the lower left, you see uh, Toshiba announced they have an MP3 player that runs its hydrogen fuel cell, runs off of methanol. This thing will run for 20 hours off of one, one uh, fill-up. Casio and others have announced that they have laptops that are going to run off of hydrogen fuel cells that are running off of methanol, and methanol is providing the hydrogen. And Ida Tech, one of our research partners, has a wide variety of hydrogen fuel cells that run off of methanol. Uh, and these systems are small. They can be run right here in this room. We wouldn't be able to hear it because they have very few to no running, uh, moving parts, and their emissions are very, very low. So why biomethanol? Well, methanol produced from biomass is a nearly carbon neutral process. Trees are capturing carbon from the atmosphere, and so when we utilize trees, and we will emit carbon in the process of utilizing them, but we are emitting carbon that has been captured in the, in the measure of decades. Now, when we utilize oil or fossil fuels, such as natural gas, which is how we normally make methanol, uh, we are emitting carbon to the atmosphere that has been sequestered for millions of years. And so, and from a scientific standpoint, we consider the utilization of woody biomass to produce energy a carbon, nearly carbon neutral process. Methanol is biodegradable liquid as opposed to, say, you spill diesel or gasoline, uh, you won't, you, it'll, it'll readily biodegrade. And currently the infrastructure exists to transport, store, and distribute it. This is not something that we need to develop. We already have the ability to utilize and uh, transport, store, and distribute methanol. And finally, biomethanol is an ideal source of hydrogen for the use in hydrogen fuel cells. So what am I talking about? Here's sort of the big picture of what I'm talking about. We can take unhealthy forest conditions that we currently have, and we can thin them to restore that healthy condition, removing some of the, that woody biomass that's out there. And in the process, we might need to uh, remove some of the larger trees to create that habitat and that healthy forest condition we want. From there, we are developing integrated technology integrating all of these systems into a mobile system that can, instead of having the woody biomass being brought to it, this will take the system to the woody biomass, or as close to it as possible. And so from there, we have these mobile systems that will then create methanol. From Once you have methanol, then, you've got a lot of options. You can certainly take it the route I've described and utilize it to generate electricity through, the, through using hydrogen fuel cells, but you can also use it directly. It's a biofuel, and buses can run on it, and they already do in some areas. So the technology to utilize it exists. And methanol is a chemical building block in a lot of different industries, um, and so we can offset the, the production or the use of methanol produced from natural gas by producing methanol from a bio um, system such as wood. So here it is. Here's our currently existing infrastructure. 
that's utilizing that small diameter wood. These are those pulp mills that I showed you earlier. And what we are doing right now is we're looking and trying to get funding to set up some pilot studies in different parts of the state, out on the Olympic Peninsula perhaps, up in northeastern Washington, and down in, in Oregon. Once we develop these systems, we, we want to uh, tweak them, uh, increase the efficiencies of them, and then we want to test them in other areas. And so these systems, as they are mobile and not fixed, can begin to be utilized outside of their initial points. From there, we get these systems uh, perfected. We, can, we visualize, or I visualize, that we're going to increase uh, their, their production, and they can be utilized throughout the state to create a new kind of infrastructure that can supplement our existing infrastructure. Now, I'm talking about supplementing, not, not, not solving all the problems, but providing solutions in areas that aren't currently serviced by the existing infrastructure. So in summary, people talk a lot about sustainability, and sustainability is where ecological issues come together, social issues come together, and economic issues come together. I think that this solution here provides a sustainable solution to many of our problems. It addresses the ecological issues. It addresses those social issues of job losses in our, in our rural communities and providing income to those areas. And it addresses the economic issues that associated with those as well. Thank you very much, and I appreciate this opportunity.